Hey, I'm Nick Von Brack, and this is The Record Podcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. I'm doing pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm about to turn 31 this week, so it's exciting for uh, such an insignificant thing to happen to me. But uh, so many cool things have been happening for me this past year, so I'm fine to end it on a quiet note. One of those things is this podcast here. For those of you unfamiliar with the podcast, this is where I have conversations with musicians and people from the music industry that I've met over the years, and we just talk, have some laughs, and try to impart some advice on anyone interested in pursuing a career in the industry, or deter them from the crippling, horrible defeat and debt that is guaranteed to be waiting for them around the corner. Either way, either way. In a little bit of podcast news, we've hit over 500 listens, so that's awesome. Thank you all for listening and supporting what I'm doing here. I've gotten some great feedback from you guys already, and I hope to get more. So if you let me know what you like and don't like about this thing, that would be great. If you uh, check out therecordpodcast.com, facebook.com slash therecordpodcast, or at recordpodcast on Twitter, you can get to me, and I'd love to take any feedback, any kinds of questions I should be asking, any guests you want to hear from, you know, anything that you have, I'd love to hear. Or if you can give me a call, my number is 1-800-EAT-SHIT. In, uh, in other news, giveaways. Who doesn't like a giveaway? Who doesn't like free shit? We did our first giveaway last week where you could get an unreleased song from Casey Bates and Nick Newsham in exchange for a retweet, and it went great. Thanks for all you who participated. So I'm just going to keep on doing these giveaways, a new one as often as I can. This week's giveaway, we are up in the stakes majorly in honor of our guest, Nick Newsham. You may know him as the singer of Gatsby's American Dream, but he is currently singing for a band called The Money Pit. And if you guys are a fan of Gatsby's, you need to check out this new Money Pit record. I've already talked about it on previous podcasts, and I'd be glad to talk about it again. This album is awesome. In a few short words, if this was a Gatsby's record, it would easily be my favorite. In our conversation, Nick and I get into how the Money Pit formed, Gatsby's history, growing up in Washington, the Seattle music scene, tour pranks, car wrecks, Nick's love of hip-hop, and more. I forget how damn funny that guy is. He had me cracking up the whole time. Him and I go back a ways, so it's good to catch up with him. And Nick and I also have a band together called Princess Dinosaur. One of our songs is the opening to this podcast, and our EP is up for free on SoundCloud, so go and check that out if you're interested. Alright, back to that giveaway. So this week's prize is a good one. Nick was kind enough to give us a test pressing from the Gatsby's American Dream record, Why We Fight. Why We Fight is the first album that Gatsby put out, and it's what put them on the map, which we talked about during this episode. How can I win such a great prize, you may be wondering. Retweet, share, spread the word. Post about this episode or the podcast in general on your Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, Grinder. I don't care. I'm going to pick the person who's the most creative, the hardest working, the one who makes me laugh the most, or I'll just close my eyes and point. But for your hard work, you'll receive this limited test pressing of why we fight. And if you're lucky, maybe Nick will sign it too. So just go out there, bust your buns this week, posting across the interwebs, wherever you want, but make sure to tag the record podcast so I can see it. Or... Email the proof to therecordpodcast at gmail.com. The winner will be announced on next week's episode. So get out there and do your thing. But until then, here's my talk with Nick. kind of silky and smooth you do sound pretty silky and smooth i'm wearing a black turtleneck <laughs> <laughs> so you're ready to do an r&b album this isn't a podcast like we're gonna get this thing going yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> well shit let's take it from the top let's 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 go all the way in the wayback machine and ask uh how was growing up where'd you grow up what was the family life like bellevue washington uh pretty actually like kind of affluent area mm-hmm uh, private school the whole way, Bobby Christian, uh, intact family, right wing Republican Christian family. That, uh, that whole stereotype, that was me. <laughs> and that's you to this day. <clears throat> There's a bit of a re- rebellion that's ongoing. <laughs> ongoing rebellion, the uh, autobiography of Nick Newsham. Okay. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so you went, you went to public, or no, you went to private, you said private school, private Christian school? Yeah. Catholic uh, school? From a, from a working class family but everybody i was going to school with was you know the kids of doctors and lawyers and stuff oh so. shit so were you were you on the outskirts of that or like were you were you listening to different music and like not vibing that whole scene or how was that all uh you know when i was like 16 
Uh, my buddy's older brother showed us like some punk CDs. I think No Effects, uh, Lagwagon, Blink 182. So I was in, and uh, but then I was told I could only listen to like the Christian versions of that. Oh, so when you MXPX. got PX, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say. So like the first bands you listened to were they were they Christian bands primarily? Uh, yeah, pretty much. But like. No, actually, I think I found out about No Effects because MXPX was wearing No Effects t-shirts in their promo pictures on their album. Gotcha. And I was like, what does that mean? So then <laughs> picked up Punk and Drublick, and then I was like, oh, yeah, I'm starting. I'm starting to play music. I got acoustic guitar when I was, like, 15, and I had uh, guitar lessons for, like, three months, and as soon as I could put together three chords, yeah, I stopped having lessons, and I've been in a band ever since. That's a... Uh that's a good one to get started with, Punk and Drublick. Hell yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Dude, being like 15 and hearing like, how did the cat get so fat? And Yeah. Uh, oh god. Linoleum. Like, linoleum, like the first, I mean, that song is like, kind of played out because you've heard it so many times. Right. When you first heard that song, that was boner inducing. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny how, like, so I think the typical thing is like, yeah, let's start with uh, Punk with Blink-182. But I think at least in the circles that I run with or the people that I talk to, no effects always comes into play. And that's like always the jumping off point of like, what is this? Like, I got to do this. Right. Absolutely. And well, and then also, so being from this area, being such Christian background and stuff, it was like tooth and nail records was located here. It still is. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that was a uh, like Seattle or Washington. Yeah, definitely. And then like MXPX is from up here and then it just kind of all sp- bond from that so it was like a huge thriving scene going on but then there was like a more subversive scene where you had murder city devils playing uh bands like the blood brothers and that was yeah. like you know and those people were like fuck christian bands where you're like i mean it's all good music so i'm going to right. those shows yeah uh and kind of trying to figure out uh who you are and and how you see religion in life and yeah you know i think actually being in those two like different scenes kind of helped me figure it out so did because i mean that's that's like grade school and high school so i don't know were you in high school when gatsby started or when when is that in the time i was like so junior year of high school that's when me and ryan started playing and then we had a band we played a show with bobby and then it was like bobby and casey had a band and so that happened in 2000 okay maybe 2001 yeah, yeah. Okay. So did lyrically, like while you're going through that kind of stuff, like not knowing religiously where you're at and like you as a person did that play into like your writing and all, or were you just like, didn't want to, that was more like personal side? No, I mean, it definitely got a, no, there's a lot of questions like uh questioning God and stuff like that. Themes like that on like volcano and yeah. And even ribbons and sugar and stuff. But I guess, yeah, look in hindsight, if I were to listen over to those records, which I probably should have done in prep, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'd probably, I could probably see kind of like, yeah, you use it as a timeline, like where I was at, uh, spiritually, I suppose. I, I don't know what it is about. So I'm not, I didn't grow up very religious and I don't know that I adhere to any one specifically or ever really have, but like, I just love that topic musically and in the world. I love hearing about it and like people talk about, you know, one religion versus that, the next, or like why they like these things, like just the topic in general interests me. So when I hear music that kind of debates that, or like hearing like someone go transition and like deal with that on an album, like the um, the S Cities Burn album, Come Now Sleep. that's a really good album because that's like a christian band first off and then that album is like him like having those questions and like kind of like you know dealing with that throughout that album so i'm like i just love that idea of like you know it's like any album like growing up or changing but it's such like a 
even bigger level. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. You think about music going back, and music used to be a thing that was like sanctioned by the church. I mean, so this has been a this has gone hand in hand with music, like from the beginning. Right. Uh, I mean, the church. Uh, they, I think they banned minor chords at some point because they were evil sounding. Really? Yeah, that would, they were like evil sounding chords, and you weren't allowed to play them. Wow. They like, must be like uplifting to the Lord or whatever. Of course. Yeah. So it's just kind of funny. It's like. We're still making music, and we're still singing about God or the yeah. lack of God or whatever, but uh, apparently it's a popular theme. Yeah, it always interests me to hear, e- even if it's not specifically, like, in a lyric, like, what what I feel about God, but just, like, things that lead to it or, like, questions that people have about it. Like, no one's really settled on it, and I love hearing people kind of go through that process, either be into it and then not into it and back in or just question it ever like i just like hearing about that that's always interesting to me tell me all your thoughts <laughs> on god because <laughs> i'd really like to meet her yeah we it's did. deep it's deep man hey, look at us collaborating again dude i mean th- this whole thing is just about circling back starting somewhere and then coming back to it so <laughs> this this episode is just about us uh starting to talk and then by the end of it we've written a song That'd be sweet. <laughs> well, we got our first bar. It's a sample. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's where you get that's where you get kicked off. Gatsby starts like you said, two thousand ish. Yeah, two thousand and one. The year two thousand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that gets all cooking. It's like a collaboration of different bands coming together. Um, is you there? Know, it was kind of a. It was kind of like you have a local scene, and then everybody from all the collective bands you kind of weed out the people who's like you know that was just my buddy brad playing bass he's right uh, he's on a soccer scholarship or whatever you know what i mean like <laughs> everybody who's still gonna want to pursue music it kind of they kind of joined together and that's what happened with us When that gets all cooking, like, is there a point where you're like, either you or the whole band are like, whoa, this is working? Like, what do you remember? Like, a certain moment of like, all right, maybe we should really do this thing for real. Um, our first, well, honestly, our first record, it was so, it was locally loved. Yeah, um, we played a show last night with my new band, The Money Pit, and yeah. I'd, I had this kid come up to me and be like, I threw on Why We Fight the other day that's such, that shit's awesome i'm like oh my god i was 19 when i recorded that that's, <laughs> that's a trip and but i do remember like packed clubs with enthusiastic kids and we thought right then that like if we can make this work here let's take it on the road i bet other people would like us elsewhere so that album being the kind of moment of like like clarity of like all right we should do this thing what was recording that album like like were, what mind frame were you guys in was it just excitement were you just like super hard at work determined like do you remember any of like what was going on when you were recording it uh well so there's a local label called rocket star recordings and they basically they signed us acceptance and a cool band called time to fly and i mean they paid like a lot of money to have us go in with aaron sprinkle at like the tooth and nail records studio mm-hmm and we did like a professionally sounding record when we were when we were like 18 so we'd never been in a studio before and we just i remember playing a lot of dreamcast nice uh, kind of dates it <laughs> <laughs> like uh tennis or uh, nba 2k or what what was your what was your flavor no no it was like uh what those cars that go around and you like battle each other you drop bombs on each other you shoot each other twisted metal no ah shit now we can we gotta really get into this what was that game <laughs> I don't know. I'm not really a gamer, but we played it a lot. <laughs> nice. It's fun. Aaron Sprinkle's the man. He's working on the new Acceptance album right now. He's actually oh, in cool. Seattle. Uh, yeah, anyways. So, where were we? What was he talking about? So, you're recording the first album. You're in a, you're a legit studio for the first time. Yeah, and uh, we just kind of... I mean, Aaron was so cool. It's got to be rough to be like a veteran. You're dealing with these kids, but yeah. I like to think that we were pretty responsible, and we worked hard and showed up on time, and... 
we made a record that thing was like we had like our first drummer at the time and he was like a slipknot fan but he could play the punk beat really good and we nice. used the punk beat like the whole fucking record that's not i mean quite a bit yeah and uh yeah dude recording that record was cool and it kind of made us think that we we can do this we, we thought we sounded good can you uh so i was just talking to casey and we were talking about some of the albums he did is it can you like objectively listen to that first album and like listen to it as a fan or are you just like ah shit that melody or those lyrics are stupid or like are you nitpicky on it or can you listen to it and enjoy it i haven't heard it in years i bet if i listened to it i would enjoy it um um, i the only thing that bugs me probably is my voice i sound i i just wasn't as good of a singer yeah and i think i made a a big leap to ribbons and sugar and then i thought that i was like really actually singing well on volcano and I don't know. I just like to always get better. But so when I listen to the first one, it's kind of like, ah, yeah, that's pretty, I was pretty nasally and like that kind of that classic pop punk singer guy. Sure. So you, so the first album comes out, then you said the second album is Ribbons and Sugar. Does anything, any, anything worth mentioning happen in between there? Or is it just like you, you hit the road, you do it and then it kind of yeah. comes organically. So yeah, at the time we're like working jobs, saving up, touring, Losing all that money, you know what I mean? Yeah. Go home, touring, go home, work, tour, blah, blah, blah. That little cycle until we started making money. And, like, Ribbons and Sugar was really when the when the extreme touring kind of started. And we recorded instantly. Yeah, and that was cool because our label flew us down to put a record with James Paul Wisner. He did like Dashboard Professional and oh, Newfound, awesome! He did Newfound Glory. He did uh, the For the Seems Forever albums. Um, so that was like a name, especially at the time. And we were just like, "Wow, this is a huge opportunity!" So we were just all in, tour nonstop, play any show, and went down and recorded that record. And that record was, I don't know, some people still regard it as their favorite. And uh, I don't know, I don't think I disagree. Yeah, it's, I think it's a solid album. That's the that's the <laughs> earliest back I've gone. I want to listen to Why We Fight now, but that's the earliest stuff I've heard from Gatsby. Oh, cool. Yeah, so so then that fulfilled our obligations to our local label, and uh, and then after that, we just recorded an EP with Casey, mm-hmm. and that was like the first thing he ever really did. And Johnny Minardi heard it. He liked our first two records and put it out on his little label. And we just continued touring, 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 put out EP, tour. And then it was uh, Fearless Records signed us, and then we did Volcano with them. Nice. So do you remember what the first, like, big tour or the first tour that you guys got excited about? Like you said, Ribbons and Sugar was, like, your first legit tour. Do you remember, like, the first offer you got where you were like, this is it. Like, this is a tour we're, we're going we're gonna to do well on or get excited about? Uh. You know, we were actually, we were doing dirt ass, like nobody's going to be there tours for sure. so for so long that we we had a, such a, st- and we were touring so much that you could really see like a s- slow but steady rise of attendance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we started touring with Fear Before. Nice. And, and then they had kind of a similar thing going. So we just became like road buddies and always would tour together. And then, uh. I mean, Portugal, they would get in there. We were all friends at the time. It was yeah. like, it was this cool, exciting little scene. And, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but we toured a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Good, man. That's uh, I, I, I would have loved to see a Gatsby fear before tour. I think that's two different bands, but you know, work well in a package together. Yeah. I think there's two or three tours that we did together early on. And then, and then, uh, John Feldman from Goldfinger, he called us and he, he like liked our record and he wanted us to stop touring with them and go to house of blues. I know he wanted us to jump on their tour for like five day, dates. Really? When, yeah. He was looking for, 
think it's when he was looking for a band to sign. He didn't sign us. He signed uh, not the used, but the other one after that. that he oh, a uh, story of the year? Yes, I think so. And uh, anyways, so <laughs> we were potentially the next story of the year. So I'm sure. Man, way to fuck up, you guys. Yeah, so, so anyways, he's like, yeah, I need you to stop being on that little tour because it was super small in comparison to like fucking Goldfinger or whatever. Right. So... And we were just like, no, we're not going to leave this band. We're not going to leave these dudes out here. We're like, we're on a package, be albeit the smallest package ever, but yeah, we're together. And so we kept saying no. We kept saying no. And then he's like, you know what? Fuck it. Both of you guys come out to Anaheim and and play our House of Blues show. Oh, so, nice. So it was pretty cool. And like, right, fear before it was like, hey, dudes, we're playing with Goldfinger. <laughs> and they're like, what the fuck? So we just all fucking hightailed it out there. It was pretty cool. Uh, that was like a first like experience of like, wow, we're playing like a real venue. Yeah. It, it, like some real shit. And they call this fags. The fans all call this fags. <laughs> they seriously thought, oh, that we were, man. They, they thought that we were straight up gay. Like they didn't like it at all. They, uh, well, everybody was wearing famous stars and straps at the time. Oh Christ. You know, the vibe that's so called bro douche thing. But how how is Goldfinger? No offense to them. How is that like manly music and Gatsby like feminine or like you know not Dude, as you man- don't you don't know like a Pennywise fan who like bro I, him is like tatted in script on his back. Yeah, but Goldfinger doesn't sound like Pennywise. Like I feel like they don't, but they had peel to the same cra- uh, to the same crowd. I, I guess same, yeah, <clears throat> they do. I was surprised. I didn't realize how much because I actually I loved Goldfinger when I was younger. Yeah, and. uh and I was surprised at how bro it was anyways. So they, uh, and we were coming from Seattle. Uh, we're like the blood brothers and we're, we're like kind of sassy. Yeah. Um, just kind of like a punk rock, like, Hey, <laughs> like a little, like, you know, yeah. And that they, you know, uh, we're in skinnier jeans than most at the time before yeah. it was like a whole girl jeans thing. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, they straight they're calling us faggots. Get off the stage, fags. And the Bobby goes in the microphone. He's like, apparently they don't like gay people in California. Oh. <laughs> and then, I mean, we had no idea. This was like a, it was like a kind of a crazy experience. So then afterwards, we set up merch, and we didn't sell one thing. Wow. We sold not one T-shirt, nothing. Uh, while we were playing, John Feldman was on the side, like singing all of our lyrics, like he knew our whole record. Yeah. But he did not fuck with us at all. Like he did not. He did not talk to us afterwards. Like, what? Yeah, yeah. So he didn't like us at all. But you know who he loved? Fear before. He really? loved fear before. And he like uh, they ended up like going and staying at his house for a while. And uh, I think him and Dave, the singer at Fear Before, are still friends to this day. How did so that- they do at that show? Do you remember? Did people like them? They're a powerhouse. Well, they are. But I feel like musically, they're so different from gold like if a pennywise fan goes and see either of your bands why would they like one over the other um because they weren't fucking gay <laughs> 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 and we were like that was, i think that was like shared the deciding oh factor. man i think we are much more like melodic and accessible so anyway so so <laughs> so like fears before his experience after the show is like i think they went and like drank a fifth with john feldman they kicked it all night and, like had this like cool like end of that cool like rock and roll experience i went to the merch table selling merch where we did not sell one thing and these two women came up to me with like rainbow patches on their purse and they're just like we just think it's really cool how you know you're homosexual and you're performing on stage in front of everybody <laughs> i'm just like oh man i didn't even want to break it to him at this point i was like yeah oh, fucking thanks <laughs> dude that is awesome that is such a good story so, holy shit I, uh, I I don't know how we got like I don't even know how if I would ever ask questions a different way to get to that story but I'm very <laughs> thankful that that just came came up yeah that's that's great um <clears throat> so then moving forward from there our tours started doing well yeah uh we were drawing kids and then equal vision they would have like new bands and they'd be like well will you take our bands out and this is at this time we're uh we're label this this is before fearless oh okay so <clears throat> we don't have a label or nothing, but since we built the following, uh, we're like desirable to booking, um, well to labels who have yeah. in-house bookers. So we're like, well, sweet. We don't got to book our own tours anymore. So, you know, you guys book the tour and we'll take your band out. Oh, that's a pretty good deal. 
yeah, exactly. So, and that person was Dave Shapiro working. He was the in-house booker at Equal Vision. Okay. So, uh, and then he branched off on his own, and we were the first band that Dave Shapiro ever signed. Okay. And uh, and that was our, how our relationship got built with him. Okay, so that's around the time of. Is that still? Is that before Volcano, or is that around that time? Before Volcano. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm accurate with that. And then um, around the same time, we met Mike Kaminsky as well. Nice. Okay. We met, we met Mike Kaminsky at a, and that was our manager, um, for anybody who's listening. Yeah, uh, I, he was my first interview on this whole thing. Oh, that's fucking cool. Yeah, yeah I love what that What a dude. weirdo. Did you see his Instagram picture the other day? Of him? Yeah. <laughs> he proposed to his cat, and he had a ring on his cat's finger. That's so good. Yeah, I was laughing. <laughs> Do cats have fingers? What would you call an individual thing on the paw? <laughs> A, f- a finger? Shit, I don't know. That's a good question. That next podcast, we'll dive into it. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, did you guys know, I mean, is there a big, is it still just a gradual climb between records or is it like uh, once Volcano happens, it's like, boom, like another, is it, yeah, is the climb still just kind of sliding evenly or is it a big no, jump? It's It was a big jump because now we're on a label. Well, you know, you got the combined success of, uh, of, touring and putting out records that people like and uh and then put out volcano and now we have actually tour support behind us and we actually are getting on like legit package tours we're going out with matchbook romance they're super fucking popular oh nice uh we're going out with emery we're going out with gym class heroes damn Uh, i didn't know that yeah we actually did a co-headliner with gym class heroes and emery emery headlined and we co- main supported or some shit though, okay depending on the coast but yeah um that was fun as shit yeah those sound like some fun tours like good bands like, and fun at, at at cbgb's in new york was the bill was emery um was it, it well it was definitely us and gym class heroes i'm trying to think who the third band was but that's a crazy that's a crazy show it's kind of yeah. cool did you ever get to play at cbgb's no that there's a few venues that we'd heard about and like people tell stories about that was one we did not get to play man there was like a i don't know if it was like some sort of homeless something there's a long line of like down on their luck looking black dudes yeah big big fucking dudes and it got violent and this was the doors right next to cbgb's and there was like there was a huge fight, and I think a dude pulled out a knife, if I'm oh, right. Oh, shit. Yeah, that was kind of crazy being right there. <laughs> like, you felt like, that's an old punk club, and you felt like, yeah, I'm like I'm in a shitty part of town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damn. Yeah, that's uh, that's one that's one of the ones I would have uh, I would have liked to play. That, I hear lot, lots of people tell stories about that that place. Um, did you ever, uh, did you ever play in Asbury Park? I don't think so. I don't know if the boys did after... I left, but I I've, I've seen that name a bunch of times. That's in New Jersey. Yeah, it's New Jersey. That's where Bamboozle was forever, and there's like the pony, the stone pony. Yeah, like, okay. Where Bruce Springsteen got popular and everything. Well, yeah, but it's cool because there's like ruins of this town that once had like a big indoor ice skating rink, and it's like all this old. It's kind of cool, kind of cool looking. Um. Well, anyways, so when you walk down on the beach, there are these giant rocks. Yeah. And the water kind of washes in between them, you know, as the tide comes up or whatever. And you can walk along, you know, you kind of got to jump from rock to rock right. at some points. Well, we've been, you know, night and I had a plane. We've been drinking for a while. And we had this, uh, this sound guy, Brant. Oh, Brant. Brant. Oh, God, I hope that's right. <laughs> uh, he was so funny. So, so he slips and falls and he wedges himself in between the rocks oh god like, with one arm with one arm down so he's like sideways down in between these giant rocks <laughs> well like tide's coming in oh god we're what a, a nightmare and we're walking and we're like i mean 50 feet 100 feet ahead of him yeah and we we for some reason we're just like kind of go to look around and like where'd he go <laughs> and we see this like arm kind of we were just like help <laughs> Yeah. We had to pull him out, and he was like, he had a big belly. He was so <laughs> wedged. <laughs> if we wouldn't have hurt him, he would have drowned. Like, Jesus. the water would have come up. That would have been it. Yeah. That would have been almost as tragic as the time that he accidentally ate a vegetarian pizza when he was, like, blackout drunk, and he was a vegan. Oh, God. 
he ate a full <laughs> large pizza. You would have thought the fucking world ended. Look on his face like, I did not. Because he ate a veggie pizza, you said? No, no, a... no. He ate, he was a vegetarian. He ate a full pepperoni pizza. Oh, he ate I, large. Thought, I thought you said he was a vegan and he ate a vegetarian pizza. And I was like, what? No, hey, he I'm ate a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Excuse oh, me, I might have those, those are the stories. That's the kind of thing. You, you're just not going to get stories like that, you know, if you if you come out of school or when you're younger, just going into normal jobs. That's, that's the things that you hold on to. You tour for okay. all those years and you remember that. Yeah. Oh, okay. One more. I got one that just popped in. I'll head. take them all, man. So, uh, Kyle O'Quinn, he plays in Portugal, man, right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was our. He was. Uh, he was playing piano for us. During, I think he started in the volcano tour, maybe after, and then he did like, so, uh, yeah, after volcano, and then through the rest of the band. Okay. Anyways, he, uh, he, he's like, he's like a, he was a short little funny dude, and <laughs> and. He, it was his turn to like sleep. He was sitting passenger seat, and he was like, "Oh, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sleep so good." <laughs> and he was kind of rubbing it in everybody's <laughs> face, you know. And like, I mean, I don't even remember who was driving, but it was like, "Fuck, that sucks." He just like, <laughs> kind of boasting about how awesome yeah. he's gonna sleep, and he could be comfortable anywhere. Like, he could get in the passenger seat and fully recline. He's like, it's like a full size bed for him. Yeah. So, <laughs> so our tour manager Billy Darling, Bobby's brother. Uh. Oh, this is the whole thing. He's going to take these sleeping pills. And Billy swapped him with no dose when we were at the gas station. Oh, God. And so he's getting all comfortable. He's got his got his pillow, his blanket, and he's like, <laughs> oh, God. All right, guys, good night. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he, you know, over time, is, he's fidgeting a lot. And we're all just watching him over the course of the next, like, two to three hours. <laughs> not be able to sleep. Like, oh, man, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> did you ever tell him, or just let that one? Right oh out? no, we oh for sure afterwards. Yeah. But we did. I mean, it was kind of like who's gonna tell him, right? Like, yeah. When are we gonna let this stop? Like, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> That's awesome. See, in and even in like on tours, like you'll fuck around with the other band on tour. You guys will play pranks, but then like even in the band itself, like you're fucking around with each other. So it never ends. Like you always have to kind of almost have your guard up a little bit because like yeah i know these guys are not going to screw with me but then that thing sort of happens there's a line yeah you do not want to cross the line and the line differs from band to band and yeah, band, yeah that's that's tough that's tough because some like so i'm obviously only used to the bands i've been in but like there's different band dynamics like we would tour with bands we just kind of assumed oh like all bands are like us like you know we've got some brothers in the band and like we're all pretty tight and we're not like no one's got like a super like no one, no one's got like a trigger that you can really like get them fired up. Like every now and then, someone will get heated, but nothing that's like, oh, you don't cross this line. Everything was pretty open. But then we tour with a band. We're like, yeah, the singer. Someone's like, dude, just don't, yeah, don't fuck with him. And it's like, really? What do you mean? Like, how is a person like that? And then you see them go off, and you're like, God, I'm staying away. Yeah, they were right. I remember one time. Uh, well, we were touring a few before, like I was saying. Yeah. On stage, Adam, their guitarist, and Dave, the singer. They they kick each other like pretty hard. Like they'd kind of go hard on each other, and <laughs> and they kind of fight a little bit. So like, I remember we were playing in Lost. I think I like I pushed off a of Bob here, like I kicked him, like I, try, I was trying to like maybe I'm implement this into the show, you know what I mean? And he fucking kicks me as hard as he can, and after the show he's like, "Don't you ever fucking touch me again!" Like, I was like, "Oh my god, I'm sorry." That's perfect. That's like a scene in a movie, like you see some friends palling around, or like a couple, and they're like, "Oh, they're, they're like being fun. I'm gonna be fun with you." He's like, "Get the fuck off of me!" <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, there's some other things like that. So I had some friends who. uh well, my 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 uh, I had a family friend who had a place down in Arizona, so we'd always stay mm-hmm. with him and his family. We were down there, and they had the swimming pool with a hoop, the basketball oh, nice. hoop in it. And so, me and my buddy lived down there, and his brother, whenever we would play, 
we would play hard. Yeah. Like, we, we played pretty hard like, dunking on each other. And, I mean, you're not going to elbow anybody in the face, but you're right. going to jump on them and try to get the ball. Yeah. So my band's in, my whole, my whole band, every member in my band is in the pool having a really nice, fun <laughs> game of just, like, pass the ball around and shoot. <laughs> and I come in there, and I just start crushing. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Jesus, Nick, what the fuck are you doing? And there I was again. God, my bad. <laughs> you see it, like, a pattern going on here? You just go too hard or, like, uh, just too hard in the paint or what? I, dude, I just got turned down that alpha male sometimes, and I can't. <laughs> it's loud, bro. <laughs> good that's that's great those are great so that so was there that's so funny the fear before stuff because we toured with them you know later on like their the last album they put out they were that was just coming out when we toured with them so not to not to say they were drastically different but they weren't doing that kind of shit on our tour like kicking each other and like they were they were just putting on a good show but they there was none of that dynamic going on so it's just funny to hear like even throughout those years, like the stage show difference between bands, like what they do earlier on versus what they do later on. Yeah, like What's I up? think, it, well, dude. Oh, I was going to say real quick. I noticed that we used to play sober, and then later on in years of touring, we would never play sober. <laughs> All of you were just random. No, no, no. Pretty well. There was times where the whole band. Uh, there was one time in Virginia where we were across the street and we were drinking uh, Mickey's grenades. And I remember <laughs> that, that Sublime What I Got album played yeah. through twice at the bar. Uh, and then we listened to another record after that. And so that's like, oh, what did we listen to? Uh, Thursday. Some uh, oh, no, yeah. Rise Against. So that first Rise Against album that everybody loves. So we listened yeah. to those three. Those three re- so that's three full albums. Yeah. Drinking Tough. And someone's like, you guys are going on right now. Oh, God. And, oh, shit. <laughs> and it was like, it was like a... I think that was Portugal, the man, and Forgive Durden were on that leg of the tour. And they were like, oh, we're watching you guys tonight. We, like, <laughs> blast into the green room. We tried to, like, eat as much of this, like, catering that was sitting there. We just looked like a mess. I think I think Bobby or Kirk was asleep as we were, like, going on stage. And so we go on stage. And, I mean, personally, I don't remember playing that show. Uh, we were told that. It was so lame because we sounded perfect. It was exactly like it was every single night. <laughs> oh, like it was lame because they were expecting you guys to just they're expecting the wheels us to, to fall fuck off. Up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like there's no way they're going to be able to perform. <laughs> and just muscle memory, dude. Like yeah. nothing. Weird. I was expecting that story. You had to go a different way. Just all of you guys just to fall apart. No, no. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just saying like that's that's how we change in our performance. Yeah. From going from sober to drunk, yeah. But I don't know <laughs> if anybody could tell. <laughs> <laughs> so l- lately, when I'm seeing a lot of bands' stories, like if I'm reading up on things, there's a lot of like bands getting jacked, their their vans getting robbed, like just bad shit happening. Do you guys ever have any any spells of bad luck, like gear gets stolen, or just like you know promoter didn't pay you or whatever? Just any because lyrically, I feel like there's songs where you, there's it's talking about like the music industry is fucked and you guys seem fed up. So I, I wonder if that comes from like some, some real shit that happened. We burned through like three transmissions in like a year one time. Oh wow. And that's expensive as shit. Yeah. That's all your profits. You're missing shows. You're stuck in Duluth or some shit. Yeah. Um, so that was, that felt like bad luck. And then also, well, we were driving through South Dakota. It's probably five in the morning. I'm riding passenger seat. Uh, um, I'm fully reclined, laying down asleep, and I hear Rudy, who's driving, scream. Oh, I no. look up and I see, uh, I see the sky, and then I see the ground, and I see the sky, and I see the oh, ground. So God. it was the first black ice of the year, and we had skidded to the left, and then we flipped three times, landed upside down, and skidded for like a hundred feet. Damn. Or, uh, maybe it was yards. I don't know. It was a fucked up thing. Uh, drum sets all over the highway, all gear fucked up, all the merch fucked up, and nobody hurt. Nothing, not a scratch. Wow, that's hard. That's that's hard because it's like because you're looking at all the gear and you're like pissed off about that, but then you look at each other like, well, I guess you can't really be that mad. Like no one's hurt. Like we're all okay. I had a full size TV next to my head, just flying around. <laughs> oh my god! You ever just think about how lucky you were? Like that thing could have just easily just gone into your temple oh. or some shit 
Absolutely. Well, so I think like centrifugal force threw me into up to the, the corner yeah. uh, of the ceiling and I kind of stuck there as it spun. As yeah. I flipped. Well, Bobby was in the back and he was next to a, he was next to a big uh, tire jack, car jack. Jesus. For the van. And that thing's fucking heavy and huge. Yeah. And he said, I believe that he said he like felt his like legs start to go out the busted out window and it flipped. But then when it flipped around and like pulled him back in. God. That is so fucked up. <laughs> Dude, it was horrifying. I mean, that was so scary. And then like, uh, so some nice driver came by and then cops were called and they're like, do we need an ambulance? And we're like, no, we're, everybody's okay. And then they're like, oh, anybody shit themselves? And. <laughs> That wasn't funny, dude. We didn't think that was funny at all. Oh, the, like, a cop asked that, or yeah, that's like, oh, anybody shit themselves? Oh. <laughs> Not like, bad timing, oh, dude. <laughs> good one, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, some kind of queer? You're crying with them tight pants? Oh, oh man, isn't it? Cra- it's crazy how much you get called a fag when you're in a band. Like that's it's like you could really get to see America touring all the time. Yep. I remember filling up gas in Florida. And the school bus goes by, and this chubby little kid hangs out the window, two middle fingers, and goes, "You fucking faggots!" <laughs> it's like God, I'm filling up gas. Like, <laughs> yeah, man. I remember. I mean, I'm, I mean, it's been a while since I toured, but even still, like late '90s, early 2000s, that was the go-to word. Like, I don't like him, fag. Like, that's just the word you could call. It. And I can imagine, especially in that heyday of like, yeah, if you wear any kind of tight jeans or any kind of shirt or have a different haircut from that area you're in, you're just you're just going to get hate spewed at you. I mean, it was it was eye opening at how progressive Seattle really is. Yeah. Uh, take it for granted my whole life. You just grow up here and you think what the oh, yeah, of course, everybody's normal. Like, it's fine to be gay, whatever, whatever. Right. But like you go to South, even like the inkling like that you might be. That you have, like, one article of clothing that somebody sees, like, not normal. Yeah. Yeah, kind of weird. <laughs> you ain't I'm, wearing hunting gear. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't no camo I ever seen. <laughs> so, so you guys, so two, 2000 was the beginning of the band. Two, how, do you have, like, an end date of, like, you guys, so you guys toured for pretty much, like, seven or eight years, or? Yeah. Yep. Which were for like seven or eight years. Okay. And did you have anything, did you guys ever get offered any tours or any kind of, you know, any kind of opportunities that you're like, yeah, maybe this isn't right for us. And then you're like, oh, fuck, we should have done that. Like, yeah, abs- absolutely. So like, well, it was kind of tough because we got offered uh, to play the starting line tour uh-huh. um, with Cartel Copeland. And we did that tour. And it was a huge, it was the biggest U.S. tour we ever did. Yeah. But we, uh, we, that means we had to turn down an offer by MXPX to tour Europe. Holy shit. <laughs> In hindsight, I would have loved to go to Europe with MXPX. Yeah. But, I mean, but also, that starting line tour is the funnest tour I ever did. Yeah. So it's Yeah, tough. I guess you can't really. That, that's still a good thing instead of a good thing. Yeah. But did man, you, I, I've never been to Europe, and I think that would be cool. I was going to ask. So you, got, you guys never went to Europe then? We didn't, you know, and uh, we never went to Australia. We actually just, we just hit them. We hit America really hard. Yeah. We uh, we were playing like 300 shows a year, and then we Damn. record an album, and then we did play another 300, and then we record an album. That, that'd be, one, I'd say, one of my biggest regrets, too, is we got an offer to go out to do, it, I think it was called Give It a Name Fest or Name Your Festival or something, and it was like kind of a warp Tour thing, but not as many dates, like 10 or 12 dates. And we got an offer to go do that, and we were like, we got to go. And then I think our manager, someone was like, ah, oh, but the money, like, it's going to be expensive. We'll get another opportunity. And we just never did. We never got another offer. And we were like, fuck, like, we should have just pulled the trigger, spent the money, and just had the most fun ever. Yeah. And especially now you're, now you're fucking dad. <laughs> Direct <laughs> timeline. Not touring <laughs> Europe, dead. And, and especially because, like... I mean, all I hear is the fans over there, like, they don't need to know the band. They'll just come to a show, and they will support. They'll buy merch, and they'll show their friends. Like, it's a different kind of scene over there. So I, I, I'm i always curious of, like, yeah, how – and I would have asked that had you gone, but, like, yeah, I wonder how much bigger you guys would have been or, like, if it would have been any different to play shows there for your band. Well, I see friends' bands. Uh, let's take Fall of Troy. They're from Seattle, for instance. Yeah. They're fucking huge in Europe. Really? 
they're playing giant shows of seeing Thomas's Instagram and it's all crazy. I'm like, damn, damn I wish we would have toured in Europe. And then, like, we had, we had, like, decent, I think we sold some records in Japan. Yeah. I wonder what we would have been like in Japan. They love American bands. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, Japan would have been awesome. We, uh, there was this local band from our town that was, like, mp3.com. You remember that shit? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, like, they were really big on that, but they never toured, never did anything. But, like, once a year, they'd go to Japan or something. Damn. And they were huge, and they would make a ton of money. And they're, like, a fake band. <laughs> like, these fucking guys. They, uh, <laughs> the dude worked at Microsoft, and he, like, rigged all these computers to be downloaded, all the MP3s all the time. So, they're, like, the number one band. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, all this shit. And we play shows with them, and they're just horrible. Ugh. And then they were just, yeah, we're going to Japan and all this shit. And they were doing really well over there. And I was just, like, scratching my head. Like, that's one way to do it. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, there is that, like, backdoor weird rigged version that pays off that way. But I'm sure you would have gone for the your guy's path instead of one, once a year Japan. You know, another band that we were we were always, like, we, were, we came up with was, like, acceptance. And at the same time that we were, we were deciding, like, tour, they were, like, <clears throat> they were waiting uh, on a deal to get a big deal and okay. I was just playing like the kind of weighted out game mm-hmm. and it was kind of interesting to see like see just two bands at one point go completely different directions right um, and like kind of how it panned out and it kind of turned out like it didn't really pan out for either of us for like different reasons we we were too we just we toured too much we should have been taking some breaks yeah um, it was just you couldn't we couldn't keep that pace and then, uh, and for acceptance, it was like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was, you can edit that. <laughs> I was like a ed- fucking, that was like a fucking nothing story. And then accepted it. We no. went this way and this happened. They went this way and I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not going to edit it because I'm going to ask you, have you ever seen the movie Dig, the documentary? Mm, no. Cause that's great. That's that it's a, uh, it's about two bands. It's about the Danny Warhols and, um, it. yeah, I have seen it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember that's what it was called. <laughs> but that's like a perfect example. Well, to you, for your guys, it said, you said it just both kind of like did its own thing. But for that, it was like one band did really well and the other one didn't. And you just watched that. Like, yeah, we didn't, we didn't have a band that like we had that relationship with that. Like we were kind of comparing ourselves to like, there were bands that we would compare ourselves to, but not like, one from our hometown that we were like, oh, look at them doing well, and we're not doing well, or like what, or whatever. You're like sizing each other up, or like seeing how each other goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they had like a, they had like signed to Crush Management, so this big management company behind them, and yeah, getting these cra- they're getting like some crazy. Like, in, I think there's like endorsement deals happening and stuff, but then yeah, like, when that shit doesn't work out, like it really doesn't work out, right? And if you're on your own, you can kind of just plug along. But now we're both making music again, and. It's kind of funny, yeah. It's kind Crazy. of cool how it works out, yeah. So that that pulls up well to this to another question is so how so how does Money Pit happen? Like I know Gatsby's was starting to put out some new stuff, released a song, and there's some murmurs of something happening there, and then that kind of you know didn't happen. So how does like how does Money Pit actually come come alive? Well, you know, we wanted to do it, we couldn't harangue all the dudes, and then so this time around, we still want Bobby and I still want to do it. He's been sending me songs. Mm-hmm. and uh couldn't get all the dudes and so we just said let's just do it and call it a different band and yeah. um here we are yeah I, like it's it's cool it's it's fun it's uh it's it's more fun it's more it's the creative process like we used to have a lot of cooks in the kitchen yeah and that uh that can create tension yeah that's so that can be tough they, got a lot of yeah. strong minds yeah exactly i mean two good ideas and then it becomes what what right the deciding factor in which one's used now it's personal you know what i mean it's yeah just, i think that's a side of being an abandoned songwriting that like it's something that like as you get older you can kind of learn to check yourself but like especially when you're younger that's like you die by your sword like this is this song i believe in this song don't tell me what to do with this like just listen to me and take my lead and yeah it can get it can get real personal real quick isn't that funny? Yeah, but you're right. It, it comes with age and experience and time, and then you just kind of you stop. You know when to pick your battles. Yeah. Do you look back on any Gatsby songs and think like, oh man, like there was a that other idea would have been good, or like why was I bitching about this? Like this is obviously the right call. Like, do you have any of that? No. Okay. No. That, that's a good. That's good then. That feels like every song was kind of served the best it could be. Then. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I think like the only complaint I've ever had about anything was uh, self-titled. It made like this kind of grungy sounding record, and the, but the drums sound pretty clean. Yeah. I kind of wish it was all over. I don't know. Gotcha. That's why the one thing I've ever... I probably shouldn't even say that. Somebody's for feeling <laughs> to get hurt. <laughs> no, I mean, I think everyone has a different opinion of... I mean, I was just talking to Casey, and I was talking about how, you know, one of the songs on Jam Dreams I wish we would have fought for to be uh, the longer version instead of the shorter version. And, and then Casey was like, oh, so I screwed, so I failed you then? I was like, no. Like, I still love the song, but, you know, you have a memory or, like, a thing that you feel strongly about, so... Mm-hmm. It can be a, it can be separate. You can go. I like what we did, but I also like what we had before that. You know, I've I found that like I really move on from the music pretty quick. Like once I do the record, like the song, like the way it came out, and yeah. then I don't really spend much time ruminating on it. Yeah. Um, I uh, I'm just kind of like trying to move on to the new. Although I'm having a hard time writing right now, so. Uh, well, I think you bought yourself some time. You put out a really good album. I love it. I've been listening to it a lot. The Money Pit album. I thought I bought I thought I bought myself some time too, but Bobby's just fucking rifling him <laughs> out, and I'm like I, I gotta keep I gotta keep up, and I'm not even close. I mean, he's probably written a whole record or two by now. It's yeah. crazy. Well, we tell, just work completely differently. Tell the dude to just chill out. Go take a go take a break, man. <sighs> yeah, but the other side of it is I haven't written shit, so. <laughs> Well, that that's good because I'm gonna start sending you Princess Dinosaur songs. Then you have to double the workload. Oh, so much just to write, yeah. <laughs> Man, I don't know what it was when we started started the Princess Dinosaur stuff. I had like a wave of like I I wrote a bunch of songs, and since then I can't fucking put pen to paper. Like I cannot have like when I pick up a guitar, it's like a different thing. Like I had a moment and I put out some stuff I liked, and then ever since then it's like once in a while a song. But for the most part, I'm like, what? What happened? Like, why? Like, it just doesn't happen anymore. Man, it'll happen. Yeah. When you least expect it. That, that's true. That is. When you think about it, that's when it doesn't happen. And then when you don't, that's when it does. You'll be in the shower and you'll like come a melody and you write this whole song and then you'll get in your car and your radio will come on and you'll be like, oh, that's already a fucking song. <laughs> Tell me all your thoughts on God. Have you ever, have you ever done that? <laughs> I probably have. I, I, uh, yeah, I don't remember happening, but I'm sure I have. I think I've definitely like written a melody and been like, "That's fucking tight," and then just like put it on a CD and just been like, "Oh, oh, that's exactly what that is." And I've been <laughs> listening to that. I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I think guitar wise, I'll like start writing something. and I'm like, "Oh yeah, this is just exactly that thing." Or like, yeah, you listen to an album a lot and then you try to write music, but it just sounds like that shit. So yeah, there's plenty of that. Like the first Doctor Manhattan album, I can pinpoint like each song. Like, oh, this is what we were listening to when we wrote that song. Like that's a that band song. Totally. Do you, do you listen to Joyce Manor? No, but I, I've heard a little bit, but I know I should because bands that I like have played with that band and are like that band. They're really good. Yeah. They're, that record, yeah, they're really fucking good. Anyways, we wrote one song that didn't make it on the Money Pit record, and oh my god, I ripped him. Oh ripped yeah, him hard. I <laughs> listened to it, and I was like, "That is exactly that." I'm like, "That's the week I really got into that album." <laughs> if you like them, uh, a band that we're buddies with that are doing really well right now from our area called Meat Wave, you should check them out. That's a cool band name. They're um, <laughs> uh, from other bands that we played with, and they played with Joyce Manor, and they are just fucking. They are so good. Just high energy good songwriting good cool. good solid band um i'll check out meat wave yeah meat wave back on on gatsby 
do you have a favorite song or is it like too hard to pick between kit favorite kids that sort of ideal yeah i've always that's like a cliche or whatever but like that it's a cliche for a reason yeah do you have a do you have an album you lean more towards one that like represents the band the best or like one that you just like feel stronger towards i think the block between ribbons and sugar lane lost monsters and volcano i think that we were like on some hot shit yeah um I, the last record i mean i love i love so many things about self-titled yeah. but uh my voice was shredded from touring so uh, much i would have loved to have like maybe like a month or two to just kind of like chill out and then sing and really give great vocal performances yeah um I mean, we were going for more of a raw recording anyways, and it kind of lended itself to that sound, but I still think that I personally could have sang better on that. Yeah. Do you, um, I can tell you what my my personal favorite uh, Money Pit song is, to, but is it the same thing? You, do you even have one, or can you just not pick? Oh, it changes, but I'd love to know what yours is. Blackout. Oh, cool, dude. Isn't that just, like, the pop punkiest banger? But it's, but I love... I love like the lyrical like cadence of parts of it. Uh, I don't know the words, so I can't throw it back at you. But there's just like the little quick little rips of lines. Yeah, and... like when uh, when Bobby sent me that riff, I was just like, "Dude, yeah, who's, ri- who's riding in the back?" Yeah, I'm like, like that's so. I just have to do that right there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Like I can tell you have, and it's not to say it feels like hip hop or rap, but I feel like when someone has that, they listen to that music. I feel like. You, you get like different cadences and different ways to deliver lyrics and stuff that I feel like I'm like that comes from that world or like that is just like a, sure. an interesting way to like do take a spin on that line you could have just said it normally but you like zip through it and I love it and just the yeah. feeling of that song it's a ripper man like I was telling uh, Casey I, I listened I was listening to that album yesterday at work and it's when this, I love the songs on it but when that song kicks on that's like okay I'm now I'm going now I'm I'm just ripping through this <laughs> awesome. record was really fun i feel i'm really proud of the record like i seriously feel it's some of the best stuff we've ever written uh i know that's cliche too but like i I honestly think it and uh that also makes it harder to write again yeah yeah sophomore slump but you know i think you like you said this is the most fun you've been having uh bobby's like ripping through songs i think you just you just put your head down and you just do it there's there's no software slump with bobby he writes he just there's so much output it's crazy yeah but i'm saying for you like i don't even think you just have that thought of like oh man i had so much fun and it was great the first album now what like you just keep riding on what you're doing it's working so you just do it and the first album the first album is great so i just don't even think i just think you just you've done this thing before man you know how it goes the more you think about it then just get in your head oh no i gotta work myself into a panic for advanced <laughs> shit to be really good dude this is what i'm doing like i'm doing it to myself like oh man roger block i can't really write anymore and then be like bobby's gonna be like yo dude i'm not gonna do the band anymore unless you write something i'm like oh no <laughs> and it's gonna be like a 48 hour cram fest and just like and then you know the pressure dude so that's that. how you work you work under stress high stress <laughs> I kind of think it's like, yeah, it's like cramming for a test. Yeah. Well, whatever works, man. I can help stress you out if it'll help put out some good songs. Honestly, dude, if you send me a text like, you fucking write today? <laughs> Did you write today? <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll start doing that. That's good. Cool. Um, so good. We've, I think we covered all the band shit. I, ca- I just want to ask a few random other kinds of questions that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, and you'll be happy to know when I ask Casey what his favorite album that he's recorded, he says Money Pit. So you, obviously you all had fun doing that. And like, it's the best representation of his skills and like what you guys bring to the table. So I think it's, I think it's good, man. I I've listened to it a lot and I haven't gotten tired of it. So thank you, sir. T- I appreciate tip that. my hat to that. Sweet. Um, so I don't even know if you can have a thought on this, but 
would would you have any idea on what you would have done if you didn't pursue music? Did you have any like inklings of like, oh man, I'm kind of interested in going to this? Um, I had an option to go to college, mm-hmm. and I didn't. And mm-hmm. it was like a small Christian college, and I'm so fucking glad I didn't. I yeah. chose I chose to be a rock and roller, and I, that was fucking fun at the time. But uh, my family business is electricians. Okay, grandpa, yeah. My grandpa's an electrician. My dad's an electrician. And like in between tours, I was working doing that. So got my journeyman's card, doing that, and and that's what I'm still doing. And I, actually, it's a really cool job. I really like it. Well, good. That no it allows me. The, it allows me the freedom to also be in a band. And uh, I don't know. A lot of people, I don't think, are able to do that. No, that's awesome. And you'll be happy to know I almost electrocuted myself uh, like a month or two ago putting in a fan. So I could have probably called you ahead of time and gotten some pointers. Just turn the switch off. <laughs> People are so fucking stupid, man. Like they're like, okay, so like if the switch is off, there's no power up there because the light would be on. So just like turn it off. So we're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I t- yeah I turned the light switch off, didn't flip the breaker, and fucking zap almost zapped myself. I was like, all right, done doing electric. Just that's oh, not yeah. my field. I get electrocuted sometimes. Damn, dude. And you still do it? You're just like, fuck it. Oh, just bang. Oh, fuck. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the oh, the other day, I was working on, like, the main feeders that are coming into the panel from the street, and that's, like, a lot of volts. Yeah. <clears throat> and my screwdriver sw- slipped on oh, it. Oh, shit. And I fucking, I ground it out against the, the big fuckers, and boom, right in my face, and it singed all the hairs off my forearm. <sighs> if I would have been touching that with any part of my skin, like, probably a fraction of an inch. Jesus Christ. Touched. I've had a couple of close calls, dude. And you just keep going back for more, that adrenaline rush. <laughs> I mean, like, I probably had two two cl- legit close calls in, Damn. Like, in my 10 years. Okay. Still, uh, though. I mean, all, that's all, yeah, like you said, you could have sneezed or blinked one way and just fucking done so. Maybe. At least pop a finger off. Pop! <laughs> <laughs> just keep rolling. Who needed it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I asked Casey this, and I want to get your opinion on it. I, I was hoping it'd be more controversial, and I don't think it's going to be. But So Casey marries your sister, and I was kind of hoping, oh, was that weird at the beginning, them dating? But he was just like, no, nah, man, Nick was all about it and totally helped me out. I was like, oh, come on, no weirdness? No, like my whole way of being a protective older brother was, well, hey, if I can have some say in the dude she ends up with, if I, yeah. can, I can vet him and I know he's a good dude. That's true. Uh that's legit, and Casey's a Casey's a fucking good dude. Yeah, um, there was I'm so glad that they're married. There was a good family feeling when we recorded Jam Dreams. Like you know, you were around, Brooke was around, like all kinds of people, and it, it just felt like a good little. We didn't feel great at a studio. We're at, I mean, we're at a house, but it was like like when we got there, there was a party. When we left, there was a party. It was just like, man, we should move out of here. This is fun. Like this is a good time. Those parties were fun. Yeah, and speaking yeah. of. Speaking of which, I ca- uh, Casey told me he's going to get me that Newsham cheese dip family recipe because I gots to have that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, it's the holidays. The food's coming out. Oh, man. He said that your guys' holidays are like 50 people strong. Yeah, we got a huge family, and everybody lives here. I don't have like one family member that lives out of state. That's, I mean, that's awesome. I would love, because I got family kind of split all over. So, I mean, we have you know 10 12 deep but like i would love to be at a holiday event that's just like yeah 50 strong yeah you say it's awesome until like you're running to the gas station for <laughs> another sixer and you see your fucking uncle and you're like, oh hey <laughs> <laughs> oh, uncle tim i don't want to see his ass come on man yeah uh, i was super baked and i saw my uncle at the grocery store the other day and i was like oh hey man <laughs> i mean like so those those um those holiday parties are like, yeah, 50 strong. Yeah. Everybody's a right-wing Republican Christian. Oh, shit. So so it could get a little heated, I'm sure. No, no. There's a vibe. They all agree on everything. So I just like to throw a little barbs out there every <laughs> once in a while. And you, just but, walk, uh, you just walk in the room and you're like, hey, anyone think uh, Obama's good? And just dip out. Like, thoughts on, yeah. o- thoughts on the Middle East crisis? And then just see you later for like an hour. And But it's kind of funny. So, like, my, gra- my grandma, she'll be like, oh, Obama's just the worst. And I'll be like... <laughs> Economy's pretty good, though. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what's Graham going to say to that, you know? Just go, I would just love to go in and be like, they still haven't found his birth certificate, huh? And then just dip out and, like, leave a phone recording or something just to get some of that. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, holidays coming oh, up. I got one. Yeah. No, hold on. So, literally, 
my parents and their friends i went to dinner <laughs> god this is an outing <laughs> no but they were they were they were saying some people think that obama's gay oh good good you want to know why Please. because he made gay marriage legal <laughs> and so i'm like because i was like whoa, 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 whoa. You guys and you and your friends were talking about this last night, and they're saying that my parents said that their friends were saying this, yeah. and that they all legitimately thought he was gay, and I just I couldn't believe that. <laughs> it's 2015. You're like, well, if you like gay people, you probably are gay. We talk about gay a lot <laughs> in this podcast. I'm probably gonna name this podcast like just being gay with Nick or getting. I gay. got my dick out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I mean, we can start this thing over and really, I mean, you, you, so you're just wearing a black turtleneck and you have your dick out. So obviously you're ready to do some kind of R&B smooth, silky album. I look like a Harry Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, man. That's good. So, uh, any bands you're into now? Any albums you're, what are you listening to? Future. I got to get into that. I heard the Drake and Future stuff and I just don't know if I've heard the right songs yet to like click onto that. That whole album's a banger, dude. Yeah. So, so okay. So, twenty-seven years old, or like, what, you think of all the people who put out. Ton, there's that whole thing, like uh, Kirk Cobain, yeah. Jimi Hendrix, yep. uh, Lil Wayne was putting out tons of mixtapes and like changed the whole hip hop game mm -hmm. when he was around that age and addicted to an opiate. Well, I think Future is legit addicted to opiate. All he sings about is lean. Yeah. And I think he is straight up a drug addict, and he's prolific right now. He's putting out album after album after album they're like legit good like so much content yeah so i'm like so what i gotta fucking what i gotta <laughs> smoke to just put out a shitload of records real quick <laughs> that hip-hop mentality yeah you got me you, you got me hip to uh big boy solo stuff when i when i went to seattle and we played that show you were listening to his first album and it got me into uh i love it, the that album and the second one uh it was really good vicious lies and dangerous rumors yes. Yeah, yeah. A lot I of wish good him production. And Andre would get back together. I mean, duh. But yeah, yeah. So future, and that's ma mainly what you're listening to. Yeah, Fu that future Drake album is getting a lot of spins. Yeah. Um, still listening to Joyce Manor. I need, actually need to pick something up. Okay. I need to get some. I need to get something new. Um, I'll check out Meat Wave next. Yeah, I mean that's like Joyce Manor kind of vibe ish sort of. So it's not going to be a new, drastic, different thing to listen to. But it's it's just good, just solid songs. I just went back to the future album Honest. It's got like move that dope. You know that song? I don't. See, that's what I mean. I'm not hip to any any future. So I got Is that the one to start with that album? Listen to move listen to move that dope. Okay. That song. It was a, it was a huge hit single. That album spawned like five or six hit singles like. <laughs> Dirty Sprite 2 which is fucking awesome and then you go to the future Drake he's crazy and like there's a weird local connection because he was married to Sierra or he had a baby with Sierra oh, okay. who's now dating Russell Wilson who's sure. the Seahawks quarterback uh, future's like a fucking drug addict and Russell's like this super Christian guy right uh, and then like there's like pictures of Russell Wilson with the kid's name which is future they had the baby they had his actual name is future wow and his stage name is Future. So and he's writing like tweets about Russell Wilson sometimes. And it's like all he did. And then in his records, he's like, 
you know I'm going to choose the dirty over you. <laughs> I, I ain't scared to lose you. <laughs> like, that's his feeling on women. That's what happened with her. Like, his record, like, his, I think Dirty Sprite 2 is legit, like, a heartbroken, sad, I lost the love of my life because I'm a fucking drug addict record, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. But Honest is when his life was, like, party, and he was living with her, and he was pretty happy. Okay. So there. All right. I'll have to check that out. See, it, I think hanging out with you, I, got, I started getting back into hip hop more. And I think the last thing I listened to that really like hit home that I that I uh, listened to a lot was the new Kendrick. I just think that oh, album's fuck. so good. So good, dude. Like com- I, I saw him. I saw him at Sasquatch this year. And how was that? How was he live? Oh, dude, he was so good. He didn't sing King Kunta, which I was bummed about. Oh, that's, that's such a, a great song. That is a really good song. Um, but I laid on the grass and made out with this chick the whole performance. <laughs> And it was awesome. I wouldn't have it any other way, man. It was like, we going to be all right. And I was like, yeah, we are. Like, slap some ass, make out a little more. time i hear that chorus i'm just gonna think of that just you making out in a field somewhere <laughs> yeah ah man that's so good he did uh what's that on his first record the the freestyle one oh, oh i think uh, i know what you're talking uh, about yeah mad city yeah i think that's anyways he he did the chorus of parus and crips all yeah. got along they'd probably be around at the end of the song yeah and he kept doing that on a loop for like 30 minutes wow with the live band getting more intense and more intense real jazz fusion yeah and he just kept doing that and he was just nailing it home it was fucking cool yeah yeah i think i think i mean you know more of the you know more the scene than I do. When I hear stuff, it's typically like, you know, it's hit mainstream or it's more a bigger deal or someone I used to listen to. But like that album, especially like when I listened, I was like, this is like a whole other level. This is shit that like, it's, it was like listening to no effects for the first time or something. I was like, this is different. He's special. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Such good production and like writing and lyrics. Yeah. It's, it doesn't even feel, it's like a whole other thing. It's like it separates itself from the genre. I still think I like the first record better. I I know Matt and Adam and them they lo- or, uh, and Andrew love the first album and I like it too. But I think it just clicked for the second album. But I want I'm gonna go revisit the first album because I know people love that album. I think the second record is more of an accomplishment. It's more of a work of art. Yeah. But as far as like what I want to throw in in my car, right? It's the first record. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of people feel about it. Um. So are there any any bands that you toured with or any bands that you listen to? It might it might lean more towards touring, but like that no that you that like never took off or that no one you thought had heard of that you wish would have gotten bigger, like ah, oh, this band like I feel like everyone's got like a little hometown band or something that's like, man, we wanted oh. we brought them on tour, we tried to help them out, but it just never happened. Well, see, not really that way, but like I say this band Waxwing. Yeah. It was uh that's where R- Rudy came from. That's oh, okay. our drummer. It was his band prior and Ro- Rocky Votolato the singer, he decided to go solo. His brother Cody Bordelato was playing guitar for the Blood Brothers. Yeah. And he played guitar for Waxwing. So when. Dude, listen to Rudy's drums on that record. Like, yeah. Rudy's a good drummer. He's yeah. a freak. It's crazy. Yeah, he's. I, I don't know if you gave me this compliment or someone along the way gave me the compliment. There's times where like, oh, your drumming reminds me of this person, and somebody gave me the compliment of Rudy once. And once I started getting into Gatsby, I was like, oh man, that's a compliment. I love like his drumming is solid. 
Yeah, man. He's hard to... He'd upstage me. Like, I'd be on stage, and all the other bands and shit, they'd come to watch us, and they'd just stand next to the drums. Yeah. And on the side and just watch him go. Well, that's a good bloodline, man. Him and his brother. I mean, good ass drummers. And they couldn't be more different stylistically. It's (laughs) pretty crazy. Did you guys ever tour with Blood Brothers? Or, like, as close as that connection was, did anything ever come of... We never toured. We never toured together, but we played a bunch of local shows together. Okay, and uh, I think that really our tie to them solidified like a lot of us like popularity. Like we got kind of cred for that. Mm-hmm. Um, because if it wasn't for that, we'd only be playing with acceptance and like Christian bands. And like oh, I said right. earlier, full circle and shit. There's kind of two scenes, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right, Casey's texting me and telling me to shut the fuck up and finish this already. So I'll uh, right. I'll ask one 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 more thing, a little a little thing to end on. Do you have now that you? I mean, you toured for all these years. You're still playing shows. For anyone listening who's like you know in a band that's about to start doing it or wants to like pursue this, what would you tell them? Any any advice? Any tips? Any like man, don't stick out of this. Don't do that. What would you say? Uh. I would say if you want to do this, you already know you want to do this and yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. And nothing I'm going to say is going to change that. That's true. And <clears throat> if you're on the fence, well, you're on the fucking fence. Yeah. There's people still on the fence. I know people in their thirties who are like, so, so like, Oh yeah, man, I meant to get a guitar. <laughs> I think I'm going to get lessons. Will you teach me a couple chords? I'm like, sure. <laughs> Where's this going? <laughs> <laughs> So the old non-answer answer, like, man, nobody, I can't nobody tell you. Even, nobody even likes the guy at the party that plays guitar. Yeah, that's true. Like, that used to be a cool thing. That's not a cool thing anymore. Yeah. Like, say, like when you're meeting a group of people, hi, my name's... Blah, 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 blah. I'm in a band. That's not a cool thing to say. No, that's true. That's a lame thing to say. <laughs> I don't I don't lead with that, that's for sure. Hell no. If someone brings it up, then I'll talk about it. But yeah, I certainly don't bring that up as like a point of conversation. Oh, my my friends always fuck with me all the time. Oh, I oh, bet. Go to the jukebox, like, at the bar, like, put your song on. But, hey, Nick, oh, this is you. And I was yeah. like, oh, you're so annoying. <laughs> hey, man, you want to you wanna sing, like, with your band? Like, that's your song? Like, get fucked. I'm trying to drink, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if I've had enough drinks, I'm like, yeah, man. <laughs> fuck it. Give me the mic. Karaoke Tonight, this shit. the sky is painted. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, man. This has been, like, an hour. So, and I know Casey's awesome. biting my ass to get this done. But, uh. Thanks for taking it. A lot of good tour stories in there. A lot of good shit that I wouldn't have even asked. So it was a good little hey. summary of you doing bands and touring and what you're doing now. Good convo. It's been a, it's been a pleasure having you on my podcast. <laughs> this is the Nick Newsham podcast. <laughs> hey, Nick, thank you so much for having me, man. Thanks.